not only did they attach themselves to a category, they also name a competitor. I think like not having a competitor is probably a bad sign. Hi everyone, you're listening to Scaling DevTools and I'm joined today by Alex Bouchard, who is one of the co-founders of HookDeck, which is an events gateway. Alex, thanks so much for joining. Thanks for having me, Jack. So today, I know we wanted to talk about uh, categories and positioning and whether you need to kind of position yourself within a category. Um, When we first spoke, I was mixing, pivoting and repositioning. Could you just tell us the difference, first of all? Yeah, so last December, we went through this repositioning and I kind of corrected you because I think when you think of a pivot, you think about the product changing in some way. So it's a combination of you changing the market and changing the product to now kind of like fit that new market. I think what we went through, I kind of feel uneasy calling it a pivot because really like the product didn't change. Um, We just took how people were using the product and we relabeled or like uh, spelled out differently what that value was and kind of like the marketing associated with that and our documentation and so on. But the the actual product is is the same product, right? So I don't really consider that a pivot. I think it's it's just a different way of explaining what you do to the market without really changing what you do. Yeah, that that makes sense. And could you talk a bit about like how you repositioned um, and and why you did that? Yeah. Um, how much do you want to get into the technical details of that? <laughs> <laughs> start, start high level and we could dig in. <laughs> sure. Um, so for the first kind of three years of Big Deck, we um, called ourselves a webhook infrastructure. Um, so at its core, Big Deck was used to receive webhooks, kind of hundreds of millions of webhooks from different platforms, Shopify, GitHub, and so on, and then act as a queue and forward, forward that to your server. Um, so we called kind of like this uh this set of components and pieces that you have to put together to be able to do that reliably a webhook infrastructure obviously that's not really a category we really didn't have anyone to compare ourselves into like ultimately the people we would like compare ourselves to are like all those like medium articles or blog posts you would see of like staff level engineers writing articles about how do you build reliable kind of like http ingestion or webhook processing and so on but um but over time, uh, users have kind of been using the product in all those different ways that really had little to do with webhooks themselves. Um, it took us kind of longer, I want to admit, to really piece it together. <laughs> um, but eventually, I want to say last May, we kind of coined this term of like a deck really being an event gateway. And I think the thing that was important for us from a positioning perspective is to say, the um, it's kind of twofold. So the first part is you don't want to necessarily put the emphasis on webhooks specifically. And the reason why we didn't want to do that is like as we were talking with people, it's be- it was becoming more and more clear that the webhook part of the problem is the part that like good engineers already understood well. It's like a HTTP endpoint. It's very obvious what you have to do to receive a webhook and so on. The part that they were struggling with is the event-driven nature of that webhook. So I think in that positioning, it was really important for us to say like, okay, let's put the focus on the part that people are actually struggling with rather than the part that everybody kind of like takes for granted. (laughs) Um, So last December, we kind of released this new website, new documentation, new use cases, new quick starts for those use cases and so on that really put the focus on being this event gateway. And the way that we think about the event gateway, it's this... Um, I.O. for basically all the events that come into your infrastructure leave your inf- with your infrastructure. But the thing that's really important about a gateway is the fact that it lets you um, interrupt or in- integrate with kind of like the outside world. So third parties that could be uh, still like the Shopify, the Twilio and the get out of this world, but it could be your customers sending you events. It could be IOT devices. It could be scanners or it could be you sending events, sending events to third parties, to your customers, publishing public event streams and so on. Um, so we really needed to like find a terminology that kind of like capture the breadth of use cases that people were actually building on top of the platform and the product that we had already. And was there like a big change in how it was perceived by people? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, And uh, I I think the change 
is not like uniformly distributed because it depends who you're talking to, which engineer you're talking to, what their role, what their level, and also what their experience is. Because when we talk with, let's say, more junior engineers um, that have little exposure to event-driven architectures, they don't already know what the challenges are are going to be. Like they haven't lived through the pain. They haven't had like a big event system related outage. They haven't like missed 100 million webhook over a weekend, right? So they don't have as much to relate to you. And for those folks, I think it's still important to talk about the webhooks because the webhooks are very problem oriented. It's like, uh, or solution oriented, I should say, in the sense of like, I'm trying to receive this webhook from Stripe. I want to make sure I process, this cor- process it correctly. Um, but when you talk to more and more uh, kind of like senior engineers, then the problem shift where it's like, well, okay, I've lived through this, right? Like two years ago, or API went down because I did a bulk retry in Twilio or it was Black Friday and so on. And you have those things that you can kind of correlate to. And now you have experience working, <clears throat> excuse me, with some event-driven architectures. You've implemented RabbitMQ or you're using SQS or Kafka and so on. And now the type of problems that you think about are very, very different, right? And I think in a repositioning, we're also trying to align ourselves more with the latter, kind of like more senior engineers. Um, Because ultimately, we're trying to position our problem as being cloud infrastructure solution for those folks that are operating at scale that are receiving hundreds of millions of of webhooks or events and so on, right? Um, And that that was like really kind of like most important, I think, shift in, in how we talk about it. This episode is brought to you by WorkOS. At some point, you're going to land a big customer and they're going to ask you for enterprise features. That's where WorkOS comes in because they give you these features out of the box. Features like skin provisioning, SAML authentication, and audit logs. They have an easy to use API and they're trusted by big dev tools like Vercel as well as smaller, fast growing dev tools like Knock. So if you're looking to cross the enterprise chasm and make yourself enterprise ready, check out WorkOS. We've also done an episode with Michael, the founder of WorkOS, where he shares a lot of tips around crossing the enterprise chasm, landing your first enterprise deals, and making sure that you're ready for them. Thanks, WorkOS, for sponsoring the podcast. And back to the show. Yeah. And so when you've got these kind of people that are very experienced, they're already doing this stuff. um, But they're, you know, as you mentioned, like running into challenges um, but they're not using tools to do this right now. Um, how important is it to kind of that you're replacing a tool? Do you need to, or is it okay to just be like replacing a workflow? Um, that's a very good question. I think ultimately what that boils down to is like, is there almost kind of like a Gartner category for what you're doing or not? (laughs) Um, And I think historically, we kind of did the mistake of trying to replace a workflow too explicitly. At the end of the day, if you're creating a new category, which I think it's totally fair to say that that we are, um, then then you are to some extent replacing a workflow. Like there's no real way around that, right? (laughs) Um, But I think that the thing that matters is like how much the thing that you're replacing is comparable to something else that they can kind of like refer to or have on top of their mind. So in the case of the event gateway, like the very obvious proxy is the API gateway. So the API gateway came around, replaced our workflow as specific kind of value proposition associated with it. So there's like security, there's routing, there's rate limiting and so on. There are kind of value proposition for API gateway. Um, And what we're saying is basically this value proposition is also needed for the event-driven world and it's resolved differently. So I think you need to have that proxy in a way that we didn't before. Like before, the only thing that we could point to is those kind of like staff level engineers articles that were like on Medium or Dev.2 or like on their individual blog and we could point to this, but like it's it's really as far as we could go, right? Um, And... Uh, so, so to answer your question, like you can replace a workflow. I think you kind of have to, if you're creating a category and then we can talk about like whether or not you should be creating a category afterwards, but, um, but you kind of have to, but I think the point is like, you want to try to make the, the 
the mental gymnastic that someone has to go through to understand like what the category you're, you're creating as easy as possible. And the, probably the best way of doing this is attaching yourself to like proxies or things that are already similar or like are um, conceptually similar to what you're doing. And then just like adding on your twist instead of trying to be the twist below the, the whole point, right? So, uh, so yeah, I, that, at least that's how I'm thinking about it now. Yeah, no, it, it totally makes sense. I think that Superbase is uh, kind of a good example there of like, you know, maybe they could have launched, and I think they were with like um, real-time Postgres, uh, and then they changed to open source Firebase, and suddenly it was like people knew what Firebase was, now they understand open source. And I guess that's what you're saying, that people understand what an event gateway is and they understand um, what webhooks are. So, you know, combi- the, at the at the cross-section of those things, it's easier to understand. Yeah. Well, I, I think Firebase is an excellent example. And I think actually you bring up another characteristic is probably essential to creating a category you want to create competitors for yourself. And I think when uh, Superbase decided to explicitly name out Firebase as a competitor, that's what they did, right? Mm-hmm. So not only did they attach themselves to a category, um, they also name a competitor. And generally speaking, I think like not having a competitor is probably a bad sign, right? Yeah. There's kind of like the, the founder in all of us that you start as the first six months, you probably don't even Google at all what you're doing because you're kind of complete denial of having like 50 <laughs> other people doing the same thing as you, right? Yes. Um, but there, there, there's this like inevitable moment where there's something on Hackers News that you think is kind of like somewhat competitive with you or there's like this VC that sends you the link of like, have you seen this company getting financed and so on, right? Like those moments come. And I think that reflex is, this, is to look at that negatively. Um, but the truth is if you're operating in a category, it's a good thing, right? Because the more people that are trying to carry that category or are operating adjacent to the category, that's the mo- more, more people that you can attach yourself to you and then have as a proxy for understanding what you're doing, the value that you're bringing. So in many ways, like we're trying to do the same thing now. Like we just released this article comparing ourselves to, uh, AWS EventBridge. I think it's a great comparison, right? And on some points, we do very well. On some others, not as much. And now that's part of the roadmap. Um, but I think it's important for us to be able to say, well, listen, like we're not the only event gateway. Um, event bridge is an event gateway. Azure data grid. I might be getting this wrong. Is an event gateway. Um, event uh, Google Cloud Event Arc is an event gateway and so on, right? So now we're kind of taking inspiration from uh, Superbase and saying like, well, our what Firebase was to Superbase, AWS Event Bridges to EGDEC, right? Um, and uh, maybe from some naivete or something, when you start, you're trying to do the exact opposite of that. Um, so if you're creating a new category, you should probably be seeking those out. Yeah, that's a it's a really good good point. And I think if there's an existing AWS service that provides it, that's got to be a a good you know, validation. Um, yeah. you, you kind of alluded to it earlier. So I'm going to ask you, should you create a new category? <laughs> um, depends if you want to play the game on art mode. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, I, I think like, I think the set of challenges that you have when you're creating a category um, are very different. But I think to some extent, we need to create new categories um, because that's how a lot of the progress happens, right? Most kind of like big influential companies created their category in some way. Now there's like various degrees of how category creating they were, um, but there's always going to be something like fairly kind of novel or like warrants like a new Gartner category at the end of the day. Um, So... So that's not to say like there's not great companies to be built in existing categories. There obviously are. Um, But I think that challenge is like an important one to tackle, especially if you think you've like found something sufficiently relevant and valuable and that you have a strong vision around that it kind of warrants, you know, you kind of taking on that risk and that challenge. Um, 
on creating new categories, I think that two things that have become like really interesting is that you're not really comparing yourself on kind of like quantitative facts of like, what is your pricing or what is future X, Y, and Z doing versus like competitors and so on. It's very difficult to then like start drawing those comparison tables, right? We're kind of trying to force it a little bit with the event bridge and so on, like I was saying, but um, so, so I think it's the first set of challenge. I think the second set of challenge has a lot to do with product because there's a set of expectations around how a product in a existing category is supposed to work. And now you're trying to like make those better. But the problem when you start from scratch is that there's an inherent risk that you get the design wrong from the get-go, right? Because there's no established way of how you're supposed to do this. And like we, we've definitely kind of been through those mistakes. Like you need to be very careful about how you name things. Like we're building the product for developers, right? We have APIs that thousands of people use. Um, it's very important to think about like what the product semantics are going to be um, how do you name things? How do you structure things? What are the core components of what you're building and so on? Because especially in developer tools, it's very hard to like go back and change those things, right? If you're building like a consumer kind of product or whatever, your V2 could be nothing like your V1 and like, it's fine, right? There's no real kind of consequences uh, to that. But for something like uh, for something like Cook Deck, it's just like that. That's a no go. Like that. That's how you destroy your reputation, right? You do a V two version that's completely backward and compatible with everything else you've done before. <laughs> um, so, so I think you have this extra challenge in in developer tools to be very mindful about uh, what are the right kind of foundations that you want to you want to build this on because you you don't really have anywhere to take inspiration from. And that's definitely been like something I've found like one of the most challenging as part of the journey. Yeah. How how do people um, digging into naming? Like, how do people get naming wrong? Well, I I mean, I can speak to her, like for ourselves. I think so. So you're not building this in isolation, right? There's other products and other categories that like have similarities or are kind of like adjacent to you, right? So one of the places where we take inspiration from, um, in our case, is all the kind of ETL workflows. So we call our primitive source connections and destinations, which is like something you're going to see in Fivetran or like segment and so on, right? Um, but obviously the product is different. <laughs> uh, it's not an ETL tool. So now you need to bridge the gap between the terminology of what you're going to find in, 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 in those sorts of, of services with what you're going to find, for instance, in an event bus. So in an event bus, you're going to have topics, you're going to have subscriptions, uh, you're going to have consumers and so on, right? Which are all ultimately kind of like, they they translate from one to another very well. So for instance, in a deck, um, a source is a topic, a uh, consumer is a destination, a subscription is a connection and so on, right? Um, but now suddenly, by the ways that you decide to name and label things, you're kind of like defining... Uh, or you're attaching yourself to one category or another closer, right? Kind of like by by proxy. Um, and for instance, like the ETL tool is something we've had to kind of like walk back a little bit because some people were just like, oh, it's kind of like five trans. Like, no, no, it really isn't. <laughs> um, so, so I don't think we've kind of like fully figured this out. And there's changes that we've had to do. Um, Oh, oh, still to this day on our API, there's endpoints that we've basically alias now. Uh, but for instance, there's the slash webhook API, which in the context of what we do, it's like super unclear what a webhook even is. Like, is it an event? Is it a message? Is it a connection? It's like very difficult to, uh, to put that together. So we've renamed it to connections, right? But for backward compatibility and that kind of stuff, we now have, we've had to maintain those terminology. Um, and obviously now in the documentation, there's this little block that's like, hey, by the way, in 2020, we did the mis this mistake and this used to be called this and now it's called that. So just FYI, <laughs> right? Um, and it, it's definitely unfortunate to have to like carry those. Obviously you can alias and so on. Like it doesn't have to impact like a new user experience. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess that's what I have to say about, uh, <laughs> about the naming. Yeah. yeah, that's it's interesting. It's like... Uh, 
Yeah. Getting your first first love's tattoo on your arm or something and you just have to cover it cover <laughs> That's it up. That's exactly it. <laughs> yeah, cover it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um you mentioned that uh you know, we, we spoke about um going into a, a new category and have to figure everything out yourself. Um when you when you don't have like a category of users like you know, user groups or whatever um to target how do you find new users that that comes back to the workflow conversation that we had earlier um because you since you don't have a category to attach yourself to you need to attach yourself to the problems that people are currently facing with the workflow that they're working with or the kind of alternatives that are playing together right um and our first hypothesis at a deck was like okay well people are struggling with webhooks right let's just write about webhooks so now um uh, we have this kind of like de facto webhook Bible <laughs> for all intents purposes, um, where you know we have hundreds of articles, like well researched, well written articles on every single possible problem you could find with a webhook. The problem, though, is now you talk to a more senior engineer. You know they're very accustomed to webhooks and so on. Like I was saying at the top of the show, and now really the problem they're looking into is like dead letter queuing management with RabbitMQ. <laughs> So it really has nothing to do with WebEx, right? At the end of the day, they're kind of like further down the 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 problem stack. Um, and I think that's the big learning that we're doing now, which is not only do you need the kind of like top level uh, content, but you need to get very specific about the problems that people are going to run into that are like adjacent to the thing that we're, you're really building. Because um, we can't explicitly write about event gateways. I mean, we obviously we do to some extent because we're trying to establish it as a category and we're trying to loop everyone else in kind of like that definition right yeah but people aren't searching for event gateways yet that much yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah that would be a surefire way to have no traffic on the website <laughs> if all we wrote about was <laughs> event gateways right um so i think the event gateway content is important because that burden of proof is on us to say that like this warrants to be a category, right? Um, so we should definitely take on that challenge. But the reality is that that data is only relevant for people that already know about us or that we've managed to like build some amount of awareness for. Um, so the rest of the content that's like the most relevant is dealing with those rabbit MQs issues or there's SQS issues or the I cost of S3 and Google Cloud Storage rights and those type of problems that you're going to run into as part of the process of building those uh, those workflow and those architectures that you would kind of like historically think as the de facto solution for, for building this. Um, so for us, at least, that's been working really well. Most of our user acquisition, most of the awareness that we build, most of the traffic um, is coming from, from those Google searches that are not branded. Right, so unbranded keywords on webhooks and so on. I think the other thing too, which I don't know if you can generalize, um, but definitely applies in our case, is attaching yourself to other c- companies or other tools um, that you help kind of like build as part of that workflow. So for instance, if you're receiving webhooks from Shopify, well, obviously, Shopify is really relevant in that conversation, right? Although Shopify kind of has nothing to do really with the problem that you're trying to solve. They're just kind of like the producer of the of the event. Um, ultimately, you're still going to Google Shopify webhooks because you need to know what their security, uh, at the sorry, the ash verification is. Uh, you want to know um, what their retry policy is. Um, you, you want to know what the supported topics, the payload looks like, and so on. Um, so then for us, it's kind of like a no-brainer to say, well, okay, we'll write a lot of content about Shopify webhooks, right? Um, and now, depending on kind of where you are in the world, if you try, search Shopify webhooks, there's going to be a table that show up in Google that tells you what the retry logic is, what the timeout is, what the ashing algorithm is, um, from our own documentation kind of above Shopify's own documentation, Right. And like the goal to do that is not to say that Shopify's documentation is not relevant. It's more to say, we'll surface that information to you right away um, in a format that Google likes. It's going to put it right up there. You're going to have your answer. And in the process, we're, tiny, we're building a tiny bit of awareness for, for a deck, right? Um, so th- those are the things where you don't need like an explicit partnership. But then there's the other part of this where 
those people now have an incentive to make their users successful with their with their with their their runtimes or their platform and so on. Um, so they want to collaborate with you, right? So now we're putting out content on uh, Vonage documentation, on GitHub's documentation, on Okta's documentation, and so on, um, because they see a vested interest in, interest in their user adopting webhooks as well, right? And we make that easier. Um, but the same is true with the runtimes. So the Vercel, this word, like Next.js, we're in the process of building a Next.js malware. I guess this, this is the first... Um, <laughs> right. And, uh, <laughs> Sorry, that was not enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah, that was good for you, Jack. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but the, but there's the, the all the runtime. So at the end at the end of the day, I think you can't really do this alone, right? You need to yeah. find the other people that are going to benefit from you being part of that new workflow and start building with them. And that's really the journey that kind of we've been on for the last like six months. Yeah. And when you say find them, do you like you know let's say like. Uh, github do you reach out to github and like have conversations with them or is it just that you just create good content that talks about github or like you know specific guides um and then they something good happens well listen there's definitely like serendipity involved um i'm not gonna lie about that uh there's definitely some of them that uh we got luckier on than others um but I think ultimately, ultimately, it's a mix of both. Um, so in the case of GitHub, for instance, uh, they were referring to some tools in the documentation um, that was down. Like it had been down for like 12 hours or something. So I opened the PR. Their uh, documentation is open source. I opened the PR um, and proposed adding a deck in there because the alternative was down. Um, and the... They basically proved it. But from there, their uh, own team working on that documentation thought the tool was real cool. And they started writing new content um, with a deck in it where we weren't involved in any way, right? Actually, we we found out about it because of just website referral. We're like, what's this? <laughs> like, what is this referring URL, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so so I, think, I think it's a mix of both, right? Like good things don't happen. Um, don't depend just by themselves. Like I think there's kind of creating your own luck that happens there. And some of that is just, you know, getting more brand awareness and having a good product and so on. But I think the other, the other part of it too, is like making a compelling pitch to the people that are working there, right? It's like the DevRel teams or the engineering managers and so on that are working on uh, those part of the product, like especially with Okta, we built a strong relationship with the engineering manager on their uh, their webbook product, right? So, um, so I think it's a mix of both. Um, is there a way, like any advice you have on deciding like which kind of partnerships or say like integrations guides to to write, like whether you were picking like say Superbase or whoever? I think it's very difficult to really be able to tell. Because the downfall of that is kind of very dependent on who's going to happen to read it, right? Yeah. So we've had excellent kind of Fortune 500 leads come from some of those like articles and some others not. And there's really like no clear reason why that's the case, right? Like the yeah. platforms are similarly influential and so on. And I think there's just kind of, uh, I think yeah. it's very difficult to say like, oh, we're going to do one or two partnership and then we'll be able to clearly tell whether or not that is a good return investment. <laughs> Um, yeah. chances are you won't be able to do this unless you're like Twilio or like big established companies with huge numbers and strong patterns to, to, to recognize and so on. You mentioned like the fortune 500 clients that, that came through. Is there something, you know, people got, people come to this page, they, they look at like how, um, this webhook works, GitHub's webhook how does it how do they go from that point to let me into let me bring in hook deck i think it's very problem dependent they need to have an issue at the moment that they read this read it right um i think it's very at least for us like what has been um what has been successful is in making sure that we're there at the moment that there's like an inflection point for them and by inflection point, I mean, there's a point in time where 
they just had a big issue. There's a big new project that the VP is pushing for. Um, there's something going on that specific point in time that makes it relevant, right? And most of the potential, I think, comes from there. But that being said, I think that's something very dangerous to edge yourself on because obviously you kind of lose some of the agency if you're now you're dependent on someone else having that problem at that very specific point in time, right? Um, so our kind of like solution to this is to say, well, okay, we have this cloud infrastructure product. We have this platform that you can use for you know your production use cases that's ready for your scale and your volume and so on. Um, but we also have those developer tools that you can use at any point in time have absolutely no consequences that you can do unbeknownst to anyone else in the organization, right? Um, and that helps you, first of all, get some of the value, get build some of the trust into the brand and the company and the quality of the product, but also be top of mind for when that inflection point is going to happen. So if you're an engineer as one of those big companies and it's like, uh, like that looks cool, but like, I don't have anything right now that I would be willing to kind of like fight for this for because there's, there's no like specific problem that we're trying to solve where we are already like overly invested in this and so on. Well, I can still like download the CLI and receive my webbooks locally where I can use the, that console to like preview the payloads uh, from the different platforms and forward it to different HTTP destination or my, my local host. And suddenly it's like, you can still derive some of the value from what we have to offer for free, right? Ultimately, until that inflection point comes. Um, I think that's an important part of the strategy. If you're de dependent on timing, you basically want to try to alleviate that as much as possible. What other reasons can you, or like what other value can you provide to people that isn't dependent on it and maybe has way lower friction, right? To get some of that value. Um, so that's definitely something that we've been investing on and we're, we're kind of seeing pan out as part of the strategy. I really, really like that. I'm going to kind of save that in my head a little bit um, and just recapping that almost for myself here that you're you're kind of looking putting yourself out there and kind of looking for that magic moment when they are looking to make big changes and bring yeah. in something like hook deck but also if they're not there's like a really low friction way for them to get something good out of it build trust um and yeah guess when good so that it's on their mind it seems kind of essential to me, especially if you're kind of product led growth, right? And so on. Cause it's like, there's so much like product led growth you can do if you're dependent on timing, right? Obviously, if you're extremely dependent on timing, it kind of sounds like a sales business, right? It doesn't really sound like a, like a kind of product led company. Um, yeah. So, so I think that component is really important if you're going for this, uh, uh, for this approach. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I feel like so many things are like dependent mm -hmm. on, timing though because it's just like it, for me to be sold to on something there's like so few points in time unless like like it has to be so compelling for nothing to be wrong or no big changes happening and i still bring it in like my friend or someone's literally got to be like jack like you have to use this new tool because the status quo is just so so easy you know it's like yeah I, I mean, I think that's completely true. And I think that's part of the difficulty of building dev tools in general, right? It's the, the bar that you need to reach is extremely high, right? When it comes to kind of like new product adoptions and so on. But there's definitely like successful dev tools out there um, that aren't dependent on timing. I'm thinking of, for instance, like, I mean, I guess dev tool, dev tool adjacent, but I'm thinking of like Raycast and Arc, and like products like Diaz, right? Or um, was it Zed, like the new coding editor? Like there's things like that where you can you can just kind of try out at any point in time. Um, but, but I think the bar there is extremely, extremely high. Yeah, but I, I think even like, even like Raycast, like you still need to learn how to kind of use it. And it's like probably going to have like one of the lowest difficulty bars. It's, you know, obviously like right. really easy to use. Straight, shout out to Raycast, but like, it's yeah. still, I feel like it's still got to be like, either your friend is like, really like, you have to use Raycast or like your hands are hurting and you're like trying to figure out how to, I don't know, or you're just like, oh, I'm so unproductive, right? I don't know. 
It, uh, yeah, it's a fair point. I still consider myself a complete Raycast noob. <laughs> I, I've been using it for a year and a half, and yeah. I think I like barely use like more than five percent of the features, but it's still fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Alex, uh, that was all we've got time for. Thank you so much for joining. Um, before you go, can you give us one takeaway that you would uh, share with founders listening? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you're building in a new category, you should be embracing competition. I think you should be trying to associate yourself with them. And I think you should be very mindful of attaching yourself to existing categories or being adjacent to those categories. Or at least that's been my takeaway in kind of like a repositioning journey. Amazing. Thank you. And if people want to learn more about Hook Deck um, or about you, where can they go? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find us on uh, X, Twitter, at Ugdeck. On myself, it's at Alex Bouchard. Um, and then check out our website at Ugdeck.com. Amazing. Well, thank you for joining, Alex. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And we'll see you again soon. Cheers. Thanks for having me.